Thank you very much for being with us here today and uh, just jumping right into here on the podcast. First and foremost, your photos, social media and everything look absolutely amazing. Everything you're doing seems to be working pretty good for you here. Um, can you describe to me your own transformation and how you went from where you were at one time to where you are today physically? So it's a, it's kind of a strange story. Like it all came out of bone density research. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks for having me. Um, Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it all came out of bone density research. And when I was developing my, my first invention, uh, which is now found at osteo strong locations, uh, I noticed that as we were applying pressure, to bone mass, you, you had to align bones on their axis. So this is the axis of like the humerus bone. Mm -hmm. and you got to load from right here to right here. You got to basically squeeze the bone uh, from end to end and shorten it to trigger growth. And that's how we absorb high impact. Like you don't, you don't absorb high impact when the bone is at an angle that isn't pretty close to axial. So uh, when I looked at what people were capable of absorbing into the bone mass at that geometry, uh, the, both the ability to absorb force and to produce force was absolutely incredible. And so I realized I was one of the only people in the world who had the data that really shows that weightlifting is really not that great of a stimulus. Hence, I called my book, Weightlifting is a waste of time. Uh, people love the title. I was going to say, thank uh, you very much. Uh, read it in the last couple mornings, get up at five o'clock, and it's been a good read. Nice. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, fortunately, a lot of people liked it. Uh, we sold about 50,000 copies, and uh, it's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Absolutely. Now, when uh, you were writing it, did you expect it to blow up like it did? Or were yeah. you just kind of putting out your oh, I, I knew it. Yeah. I was like... I have a contro controversial message, but it's right. Mm -hmm. And I can really, also one of the big premise points is that people don't really get what they want out of fitness. Like I know people who have been involved in fitness for years and do they look a lot different than people who've been sitting in a pizza place for years? Not really. It's like, true. you know, we, we, we all can all can point to the outlier who's, you know, in the NFL or he's a bodybuilder or whatever, or she's a bodybuilder. Uh, but those are, those are the general population. It's not like signing up for the gym and going two or three times a week means you're going to look like an exceptional athlete. Right. You'll probably look like nothing. And there's statistics in, you know, in, to support that argument, uh, you know, like the leanest one percentile. Top one percentile of males in the United States is 10.9% body fat. That is highly unimpressive. Mm -hmm. That's the top 1%. That's like you can sort of see your top of your abdominals. Really not that great. Now I'm right. talking about calipers, not DEXA, because DEXA adds basically four points because it's really measuring something different. Mm -hmm. DEXA like truly your percentage body fat, whereas the calipers is more like a skin fold plus adipose tissue. Right. Measure. So, um, yeah, that, that was a stimulus for the book. And coincidentally, like w once I developing the medical device, I just want to go back, mm -hmm. uh, developing the medical device, re realizing that these people, they had such a terrible stimulus. I, at first I thought, well, what we need is a variable weight like variable resistance. Now we already had band training, but I realized that the magnitude that was required to deliver the appropriate force to the human body, uh, if you grabbed a band and threw it around your back of the appropriate tension, mm -hmm. you break your wrists. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you need so much force that you really need an Olympic bar with rotation, you really need a, a, a second ground to stand on so that the uh, the late, because it has to be latex. Most bands are made out of petroleum. 
Okay. And uh, they stretch out, and you know, there's a reason they're like five dollars at Walmart. It's because like, like the Therabands you're talking about. Yeah, uh, actually, th Therabands are really light, and they are made out of tree latex. Um, so that's that's why they're cheap. But I'm talking about the thicker, you know, like workout of the day kind of bands. Mm -hmm. that they like sort of oddly and randomly throw into like CrossFit workouts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um. Yeah, those those are really low quality, right? Uh, and they, and like I said, they stretch out, so people think they're getting stronger, but it really the band's getting longer. So um, when it comes to like your X three bands, for instance, here, what makes them so unique? Why are they so special? I mean, power. Being Just fortunate enough to use them, heavier. I can tell a difference. But a lot of yeah. people when they first come in and take a look at them, oh, there's a bunch of bands. I got to get a sign, got to make a That's big deal. That's why I, 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 I correct people when they say, oh, I like your bands. I'm like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Mm -hmm. self bands. Like, it's a whole product. Those yeah. bands, if you use those bands by themselves, they will break your wrist or your ankle. Like, yes. They're, they're part of a whole thing. Tried that 600 pound uh, off the ground the first day, and I said, nope. Funny thing, uh, most NFL players don't use that orange band. Really? They're not ready for it. Now, they also use the product correctly, which a lot of users do not, mm -hmm. because lifting and uh, ego go hand in hand, I suppose, uh, with <laughs> probably not just dysfunctional people. Probably some <laughs> of people get carried away when it comes to that. So uh, oh, we got a lot of dysfunctional people on the Internet. Don't worry, I'll get to that. <laughs> but uh, the uh, yeah, there's just some regular people that like they think the moment they can move the strongest band just a little bit, they're like just as strong as you know a pro athlete or Dr. Baker, who's you know holds like deadlift world records. Yeah, uh, yeah. Except he's six four, and the taller you are, the harder it gets. It's actually, it's when I do a deadlift with the orange band, it's six hundred fifteen pounds. It's 750 pounds when Dr. Baker does it because he's four inches taller than I am. And he was actually the driving force when I was out there uh, about a month ago. He swears by it. I mean, he said, yeah. this is what I do. This is all I do. And he is a physical specimen. So yeah. kind of going back to what you're talking about, how a lot of people, you can't tell the difference in what they look like, whether they go to the gym three times a week versus sitting in a pizza place all day. Why do you think that is? I mean, there. I see on all of your stuff, you list the research, and it's great. People don't read the research. They just go haphazardly doing whatever. Why do you think? Right. People, Some muscular they, guy tells them, oh, you need to do this and this and this, and they're sold. They just go and do it. Right. And, of course, it's not they're, – they're not the same guy. And, you know, very often what somebody does in their workout mm – -hmm is not what got them there. Mm -mm. Yeah. I mean, like what got almost everybody there is very basic barbell movements. Right. Uh, Cause you know, like when did, when did most pro athletes start lifting like in high school? Well, True. they didn't have fancy equipment back then. So who cares what fancy equipment they, they use now? Doesn't matter. Like so, they, they, didn't, they didn't get that way. And also a pro athlete's number one priority is not getting injured. They don't care about getting stronger at all. Like the NFL guys, when I first started talking to them, I was talking about, you know, they're going to break strength records. And they're like, yeah, I just want to squeeze another year out in the league. Makes sense. And I heard that. It only took me like 10 times of hearing that. Like, huh, injury prevention. Coincidentally, that was why the Miami Heat uh, wanted to use the product. Mm -hmm. And they exclusively use it. That's it. They do their basketball drills, of course. So you got a professional athletes now that are using, I call it the technology, the X3 yeah, technology, using know. the X3 product there. Um, so why hasn't, why does the general public still not believe in a different change, do you think? There's this paradigm of you need dumbbells and barbells and running for miles and miles on end, and that's the only way to get and be in excellent shape. How do we change this paradigm for individuals to actually understand the science behind it and that this works better? Money. <laughs> Good answer. It's, it's marketing dollars. Like mm -hmm. 
why does everybody think well, let, let's let's use an obvious example cardio is great if you want to be a marathon runner if you want to long, run long distances and use a small amount of energy to do so you got to run marathons and then you'll get better at running marathons if your goal is losing body fat cardio is one of the worst things to do and there's 40 years of research mm -hmm. 40 years saying you chronically do cardio, you chronically raise cortisol levels. Cortisol sacrifices muscle tissue and protects body fat, meaning it keeps you fatter as long as possible. So it gives you exactly the opposite of what you, I, you know, for all the people who use cardiovascular equipment or engage in cardiovascular programming, I'd say maybe one tenth of one percent are actually interested in being great distance runners. The rest think they're getting skinnier mm -hmm. and they're not. And if they do lose weight, they're losing muscle. They're most likely losing muscle based on how the hormones come out. And you don't, you really don't want to fight your hormonal system. <laughs> we should it's a losing battle. I kind of promise. encourage it, right? Not right. Take away growth well, hormone. Encourage a way, right, right. So you got to do things that are going to encourage a leaner physique and a more muscular physique. Of course, one of the ways to get leaner is to become more muscular. Because your percentage of lean mass goes up, mm -hmm. the percentage of fat mass goes down because it's a percentage. So, yeah. Um, I tell people focus on strength. And so there's, there is nothing else. In fact, I, I would almost argue there is no such thing as cardio. Cardio is just terrible strength training that doesn't give you any strength. It's <laughs> a good way to put it. I mean, if your goal is improvement of your physique, you know, like the people who are distance runners or cyclists or whatever, yeah, they got to do that because, you know, they want to lose muscle. You don't want a 220-pound cyclist. Like that when I go on a bicycle, I can go really fast for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, oh, there's a myth that – muscular people have bad cardiovascular fitness no we lose our oxygenation very quickly mm -hmm. but why it's because the muscles are bigger and they draw more blood it has nothing to do with your cardiovascular health in fact i reference a meta-analysis in the book that talks about um talks about how strength training is equal or superior to cardiovascular training when it comes to cardiac health. But when you look at the muscular guy running up a flight of stairs, he might be out of breath. Right. That's because his legs might be four or five times bigger in diameter than the little guy, the marathon runner who's running up the stairs. Right. So you got to train for something specific. If That's you right. want to be a marathon runner, mm -hmm. Train for marathon. If you want to be a loser, you train for the luge. You get better at it. That's right. Pretty simple in that one. <laughs> when it comes to biomechanics, though, we're talking about injury and injury prevention. Dumbbells, as we, you've said in your book and in a lot of different things that you've done here, um, you get the most strain in the weakest position. Can you discuss here about variable? Is that? Barbells are the same. Absolutely. So what is the difference here with bands? Why do they work so much different than any type of uh, barbell or dumbbell when it comes to improving strength and decreasing injury? So I mean, the, the X3 is really set up to do this right for every movement. But what you want to do with any variable resistance approach, you want to go to the gym and spend an hour screwing around, you know, hooking bands to a rack. You can do that too. Mm -hmm. But um, what you want is in the weaker positions where the, the bones are the least axial in formation. So like back here in the back of a, a chest press mm -hmm. where my elbow is like the most bent, that's the weaker position. And then as I extend my arms, that becomes a more powerful position. Right. So, um, yeah, it's a weak position. So you're contracting very little muscle. And you're really overloading the joint. In fact, Peter Atia frequently says the problem with weightlifting is like he he's a big fitness person. He pretty much quit being a medical doctor so he could 
show people a better way to health through nutrition and exercise. But he, he says, I, I don't really like weight training because it overloads joints and underloads muscle. And so he does a lot of other activities, uh, mm -hmm. some cardio, some are more like hit training. He's a very fit guy, but he's slim. Like he does, does not carry around a lot of muscle mass. And uh, it's because of that problem. Now, the solution of the problem is lighter weight where the joint is compromised and extremely high weight when the joint is optimized. So you can fatigue in accordance. So you still fatigue the weak range of motion in your last repetition, but the last repetition might only be one inch because you start by going full range of motion and then you go half range of motion when you can't get to the full anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you get to like, you can barely move. So you pretty much keep going until you can't move anymore. Like at all, like you cannot get the bar off your chest. So how many repetitions typically would you recommend to be able to do? Anyway, so we go higher repetitions because the weight is so high. Mm -hmm. It's more of a safety thing. Mm -hmm. because, you know, like I'm already pushing high repetitions with my chest press, which is 540 pounds at the top. That's so I really want to drop more than 540 pounds on myself. Mm. If I let go of the bar by accident, if something goes now, it's never happened to me, right? Because I pay attention while I do it. But there's always somebody who's like trying to like watch the news and work out at the same time. <laughs> you know, like I when 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 TVs started showing up in gyms, mm -hmm. you know, like the nicer side of me was like, do they know what happens here? Like, or is this just for like the people who don't really understand? They should be focused on what they're doing. And you know, the meaner side of me was like, I should burn down this building. These people are crazy. <laughs> they're going to distract people. Mm -hmm. They're going to get injured. Or they're going to half-ass their exercise. There's no reason for them to even be there. Right. You want to watch TV? Go home. It's one or the other. No. I don't watch TV while I'm answering emails. If I did, True. it would be nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I didn't write my book while I was you know, watching – predator on repeat <laughs> fun. uh you know like you gotta focus mm -hmm. so yeah like i that was a minor segue sorry about that yeah now in a lot of your information when it comes to x3 and using variable resistance bands pretty much advocate in road training just the one set to failure would you ever utilize your bands with multiple sets using, say, blood flow restriction and be able to get better results, equal results? Um, how would that change? No, you'd get worse results from that. Uh, when you do an X3 session, you are unable to make the target muscles function mm -hmm. after that. Like, you're done. That's and the point. It's because it's such a deep level of exhaustion. But the human body when given variable resistance, mm -hmm. does blood flow restriction on its own because you're not able to lock out and you don't rest at the bottom. So we use constant tension. Mm -hmm. And with constant tension plus the variable resistance, it keeps blood from entering or exiting the muscle. So you have in... And I'm talking about all muscles, not just the arms and legs. I'm talking about the pectorals. Mm -hmm. If you keep them from relaxing. Also, when you lock out, like at the top of a squat or your knees go straight, mm -hmm. you just shut your quads off. So you turn them on, you turn them off, you turn them on, you turn them off. Is that a good growth stimulus? No, it's garbage. So uh, you got to keep the constant tension. And with the variable resistance, it is of equal difficulty no matter where you are. So, you know, like in a regular squat, if, you, if you're kind of hanging out at the top and catching your breath because you're all, either, either locked out or almost locked out. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, it's, it's whatever you're squatting, it's light at the top and heavy at the bottom. Right. X3, it's just hard as hell everywhere you are. It so is. you just keep moving. There is no, there is no resting. There's nowhere to rest. You're, you're just getting pounded uh, by extremely heavy weight. Uh, and it's relative to the position that you're in. And so if you keep 
from getting blood flow into those target muscles, you're having a hypoxic moment. Mm -hmm. And it's hypoxia that creates the positive effects of blood flow restriction. And then also there's a reason that when people do blood flow restriction, they have to lift super light. Mm -hmm. And it's because neural inhibition happens. Basically, your body knows part of it's being choked. So it shuts most of the muscle off. So mm -hmm. most of the muscles shut off. Are you really depriving tar the target tissue of oxygenated blood? Not really, because most of it won't even come on. So you, you get a better effect of just doing a regular X3 set than you would from doing blood flow restriction. Fair enough. How about yeah. uh, range of motion? Does the full range of motion actually matter, or can you end up doing quarter half squats and still be able to get the same strength gains based upon um, the entire muscle activating the entire time. Yeah. yeah. Like we do use close to a full range of motion, mm -hmm. not, you know, like how you ever once in a while see like a cambered barbell so you can go, you know, lower than where your chest is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just much harder on joints. So, yeah. You know, working the bottom where the joint is in the poorest possible position. There's there's little reason to do that, and there's a decent likelihood you're going to get hurt. So we don't do that. We never do that. Um, but having a range of motion takes us to sarcoplasmic fatigue. Mm -hmm. You're burning up the ATP, the glycogen, the creatine phosphate, all the fuels in the cell. And because you're burning them up very quickly with a variable resistance, your body knows it needs to replace what was there plus add more. So, uh, yeah, you you would get less of that if you really compromise the range of motion. But, yeah, some people, they don't have the knee mobility or they have, like, a knee replacement, mm -hmm. and they can't you get to parallel. Like, when I squat, I go to parallel. Uh, but it's a lot lighter when I'm at the bottom than it is at the top. So that's not stressful to my knees. Uh, but let's say somebody just doesn't have the range. Mm -hmm. You know, like they were told to go to physical therapy and they just like went to Hawaii instead. <laughs> uh, and there are a lot of people like that. Yes, they are. Uh, right. And then, then they lose that range of motion. So, yeah, you can still be very successful doing a half squat. Mm -hmm. Not as successful as if you engage more of the tissue from that sarcoplasmic standpoint. What are your viewpoints here on individuals who, if they are lifting for three weights here, decide, you know what, I'm getting older. I don't need to hit the 600-pound squat anymore. So let me lighten up the load a little bit. Uh, there's a guy uh, when I was coaching the Blue Jays there. He could do a 500-pound squat, but in the regular season, the other coaches wouldn't let him do more than 225 and let him go to 20 reps. My concern was that he's going to atrophy. Um, he's not hitting his peak anymore. When it comes to that, you know, a lot of individuals nowadays I'm finding, you know, let me squat 135 50 times. Is that even doing any good for them? Not really. Like there's no, and I, I reference, and I, this is chapter two, uh, chapter three of the book. Mm -hmm. There's no getting away from heavy. Now, X3 is a far heavier and safer approach to stimulating strength uh, and, and gaining muscle mass. So I would say, no, I answer a lot of questions by saying everybody needs an X3. Uh, you know, I mean, am I selling it? Yeah. I get, I get, I get like trolled for like, you know, like somebody right. This bastard is just trying to sell his product. It's like, you commented on an ad. <laughs> yeah, that's what ads are for. But, you know, it's some sort of like Antifa attitude, like nobody's allowed to succeed. Uh, that's just what losers say because, you know, they didn't succeed. So why should anybody else? Um, yeah, I don't care about those people. Um, but um, it's, it's easy for me to pitch my own product. But in reality, like if they could – still get heavy mm -hmm. with some approach to variable resistance and diminish the risk, you know, at the bottom mm -hmm. of the movements, 
then they'd be better off. But like ultimately, uh, now you can maintain muscle mass. Like I know a few former NFL guys who have all kinds of joint pain and, and they, uh, they, they get to a point where they can take the muscle to fatigue and uh, do like regular lifting. I'm not, I'm not talking about like some of them I switched over to X3 and then some other ones are just kind of, I'm warming them up to the idea because like they don't want to lose their muscle mass, but they can't lift because mm -hmm. everything hurts. So right. like I, you know, I go, okay, well, you know, you, if you're going to do 50 reps with 135, uh, you're probably not going to lose much muscle mass. You're still engaging the musculature. You're still going to fatigue. But if you want to grow, if you want to even grow tendons and ligaments, mm -hmm. there's no getting away from heavy. Right. So the bands, the variable resistance does create a way to stay heavy while maintaining. Oh, heavier. You go way heavier. Like, I mean, I'm hitting uh, my chest press. I 540 pounds, 25 to 30 repetitions. I would never get to that kind of weight with a regular iron. Mm -mm. No, this is just far better. And I've never been at risk of anything. I've never like pulled a muscle, got a cramp, nothing. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to training ranges of motion, which you've probably heard guys, you know, I'm changing this range of motion, tweaking the, uh, the way I hold the bar or the, the dumbbell here to hit the muscle this way. What are your thoughts about training ranges of motion here? No. I mean, we've got weak spots, so let's train that weak spot. We got the strong spot, so I mean, uh, look at it this way: like someone who I'm trying to think of the best like sport that people can really understand. I was going to use baseball pitchers, but. Oh, no, I got a better one because not everybody understands the biomechanics of a pitch. So I got a better one. Okay. Sprinters. Sprinters use seven degrees of flexion behind their knee mm -hmm. when they sprint. They have 180 available. Why would they only use seven? Right? Like, do they work on just that range of motion? No. Nope. no in fact, they have drills where they really exaggerate their their biomechanics uh you know you do butt kickers you do all kinds of different drills uh to stimulate some strength and flexibility and activation sort of the neural plasticity be able to learn the pattern you know if all of a sudden you're sprinting and the ground is a little bit uneven or something like that you can make the alteration you know in a hundredth of a second right without even thinking about it so um, they don't train specific ranges of motion. You don't need to do that. Mm. But, and, you know, it might have just been one of those things where somebody who didn't know what they were talking about just came up with something and was like, oh, <laughs> we're tell everybody this is important to do. It happens a lot. And maybe somebody will buy my book or something. Yeah, but there's no, there's no backing to that. A lot of people are still obsessed with stretching as well. Um, I notice a lot of people still, I don't know how, but still doing long, slow, static stretching before physical activity. Uh, what, what, what's your insight on that? Is that going to injure people more? Yep. No. And, and why? It's going to shut muscles off. Yes. Yeah. Turns muscles off. Stretching after you work out? Mm -hmm. Different story. But also it's, it's not really a range of motion thing. It's a getting blood into the muscle thing. It's a stretching the casing around the muscle thing, which is, uh, I think that's like the ninth chapter in the book where I talk about hyperplasia. Mm -hmm. So a lot of individuals, I'm not trying to beat up on yoga by any means here. They believe that they can get stronger by doing yoga. It's been advocated, um, documentary on Netflix pretty recently, that you want to get stronger, you want to build muscle, you do yoga, and you become healthy for the rest of your life. <sighs> so yeah. Netflix says a lot of things, right? Yeah. So it seems that <laughs> there's yeah. the muscle off, right. And by turning the muscle off, <laughs> we're not actually stressing it in any manner in order to develop it or no, the joint or the, the tissue. Off. I mean, like 
Does pulling on your hair make it grow faster? I haven't tried. <laughs> no, no. Theoretically, definitely. Yeah, no, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like what? Uh, yeah, it, it's um, yoga people are a little like like vegans, where it's it's almost a religious commitment, and mm -hmm. you know they they gotta justify it somehow for some reason. I mean. You don't really need to justify anything you do. I mean, as long as it's within the laws, though I'm not even sure that's a thing anymore. Uh, the, um, you know, like you, you talk to a vegan and it's like, oh, that guy died of cancer. He didn't have enough vegetables. Like, okay. Right. Yeah. That's not true, but I'm just going to roll my eyes and walk away. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not too worried about that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like the world being confused because anybody who tries that will not be successful at it. And so they just give up on it. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they were trying to pitch other than, you know, like yoga, kale smoothies and good vibes are what shaped the world. No, it was books and guns, but nice idea. It is. It is. Now they're switching over here to some bone talk for a little bit. Individuals are osteopenic, osteoporosis. They're often prescribed, recommended different drugs and told take a calcium supplement. Um, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes there's little to no change whatsoever. All right. <laughs> I see or they lose bone density. So okay. I love what they be doing? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so Calcium is the only mineral your body self-regulates. Mm -hmm. So if you eat more of it, your body gets rid of more of the old calcium because it's got new coming in. But then it also, the body has a storage mechanism. So calcium is primarily what your physical chassis, your structure is made out of, your bone. Mm -hmm. Now there's like 12 other minerals that are in there too, but it's primarily calcium. But when you want it to be retained in the bone mass, you have to give the body a reason to retain it. Mm -hmm. So what happens is somebody hits menopause, so they start losing calcium. Because uh, that's what happens in menopause. Goes you know, down, calcium's lost, yes. Then they take the supplement, and it forces them to lose calcium even faster, though they have the same amount in the blood they're forcing it out of the bone. So does it make your bone stronger? No. Mm -mm. It doesn't. So everybody gets calcium in their nutrition unless they're just eating like Twinkies or something. <laughs> uh, that's a problem too. But uh, it's a separate problem. Uh, but, you know, give your body a reason to use it. And then you don't really have to worry about how much you're consuming Mm -hmm. If there's some there, you just want to make sure it's going to the right address, as in not going into kidney stones. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's another thing that happens when people take a bunch of calcium supplements, they have much higher likelihood of getting kidney stones because it's largely just calcium. They're so calcium deposits. Yeah. So, yeah. how would you uh, force more osteoblast activity, build some bone density? Right. Yeah. High, either high impact or use the osteo strong devices now what are the osteo strong devices for a lot of people that don't know they haven't looked that up yet they don't know i see you're expanding it seems like pretty rapidly there uh, good for you nice so Thank what you. are these machines i mean we use in the fit lab the arx so i understand mm -hmm. that and it seems like these units are kind of their own individualized arx's maybe i'm a little off here what are they and how do they work? Yeah, it doesn't work like like X3 is more like ARX. Mm -hmm. ARX provides a, a variance, you know, in accordance to bio, biomechanical capacity. Uh, I love the ARX because it's so expensive. <laughs> right. When you have one, your place is cool. <laughs> well, thanks. And it also, like when somebody uses an X3, they're like, wow, this is, this X3 is $550, but the ARX, I think the price has changed. But, you know, like the last time I looked at one, it was more than my Lamborghini. So, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> wow, somebody made like a four hundred thousand dollar X three. <laughs> it's cool. It's really cool, but man, is it expensive. Um, also, I will say, like, if you have an ARX, your wellness facility, people are going to come back to use that. Mm -hmm. It's cool. It is. It's just feels good to use. It is. And uh, it, our ARX actually broke down a couple weeks ago, and I'd known about the X3 for months and months and months. And then I saw Dr. Baker, and he was mm -hmm. swearing by it up and down, shows me all of this beautiful gym he's got. He said, nope, the X3 is it. That's all I use. It's my forte. And then the ARX breaks down, and I said, crap, people are going to leave. Need something now. Let's just do it. My wife said, buy it now. So we got that and people are happy. People are very happy. Yeah, they love it. It's yeah. less than the dinner tab. It's like, yeah. why not? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I keep one in my suitcase. I have one in the trunk of my car. Mm -hmm. And then I have one in a wine barrel uh, in my living room. So I have the top cut off a wine barrel. I just reach in and pull, you know, pull, play it out. And have cool. a glass of wine and do some squats. I mean, you know. Yeah, there's, there's no wine in there. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, two X-rays, you know, in case I have somebody uh, peer pressure into working out with me, which is pretty much everybody who comes over. Pretty often, right? Yeah. yeah they, don't have, <laughs> they don't have a choice. So how exactly do your, your machines work in your your clubs there? Oh, at, at OsteoStrong. Yes. Right. Yeah. At OsteoStrong, yes. So it, it, the robotic arm puts you in a position mm -hmm. where you would naturally absorb high-impact forces. So I'll use my arm as an example again, 120 degree angle right here and more like that. And the back of the hand, where, where are we right here? Back of the hand in line with the clavicle. So when you trip and fall, mm -hmm. that's exactly how you protect yourself. So that's just the example for the upper extremities. Now we have upper extremities, lower extremities, spine and core. Mm -hmm. so there's four movements, but... We're trying to identify, we do identify where you would naturally absorb high impact forces and then allow you to self load in those positions and create as much force as possible while you're looking at what you've done in previous sessions. So like first session, best session, last session and current session are all sort of on a, on a sideways bar chart mm -hmm. and you're trying to exceed all or one of those numbers. And how long does the individual keep the tension going? Uh, you you want to hold for five seconds <coughs> because it'll give you an average mm -hmm. of five seconds and it counts down for you. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then you go on. And as soon as you log in, the robotic arm moves it to exactly where you've been measured. Very cool. You need to be. So mm -hmm. it's, it, we take the positioning variable out of the equation. The same every time. And how did you actually come up with this? Is this also part of your backstory on um, trying to help build bone density with your family? And yeah, yeah. You my mother out? diagnosed with osteoporosis. And then <clears throat> I wanted to, I want to help her treat it. I decided I was going to build an impact emulation device or a series of devices. And that, that's really where it came from. Like it became robotic and really fancy when it's it was working. Like mm -hmm. my mother's bone density in 18 months, like she went from ha having, like she was in her seventies, she had like the bones of a 90 year old. And then 18 months later, she had the bones of 30 year old. So yeah, yeah, she was very happy. And uh, so was everybody else who's using it. Cause I put it in a test facility and I ran that test facility and had 700 people using it and that was the subject and then so I did this and then I went to get my PhD after that so when I went to to do my PhD um it was more like I'm not screwing around I my, my objective was really just learn how to write academically mm -hmm. like I wanted to be able to get published uh, I wanted to be able to be taken seriously when I was speaking at medical congresses. So, yeah. But that was the only thing I cared about. I was like, I'm not going to be a university professor. So, you know, I just got to get it done. You wanted the credibility that the PhD comes in. Yeah, and the experience. I, I wanted mostly the, the authoring. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just, you just read my book. Like, mm -hmm. that was scientific authoring, except... A scientific offering, uh, authoring that was designed 
for the layperson to read. So, and I, I got that also because I would tell my professors, I'm probably going to spend a lot more time giving hard science to people who've never read hard science. So it was almost like I was tailoring my needs to what I knew I needed to do to get the message out there. And it made me a much better writer. That's all I want. Yeah. It, reading academia can be very complex. I mean, right now my wife is getting a uh, PhD in applied psychophysiology. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we can kind of joke when I was going to chiropractic school, she had no idea what I was talking about. She's getting uh, a degree in applied psychophys and I'm like, break this down here a little bit. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, this is important. Uh, I would say that like academia in general has a lot of really unnecessary hurdles. Mm -hmm. You know, writing like that. It's like some of the time things are just unnecessarily complex. Mm -hmm. You find and that? I almost, Good. I almost feel like the more complex your clinical submission is, the more the peer reviewers fall all over and say it's great. <laughs> and, you know, like... Like I wrote a meta-analysis in 2016 and that was like, uh, it was the hardest thing. Actually, uh, Henry Alkire, he's co-author of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, he and I worked on that together and uh, it, it was like months of work for like a nine page paper. Mm -hmm. At the end of it, it was like, God. And, and you know how many people have read that thing? How many? A couple. Yeah. I mean, like through like academia.edu, like, you know, right. not, not just page clicks, but, you know, someone actually going and finding it on an academic website. And, you know, that's been referenced a bunch of times. I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, but I like upped the value of the journal because it got referenced so many times. <laughs> but it was, so it was good paper, but so many things I had to put in that were just unnecessarily complex. Whereas it could have just been like, here are the studies we looked at. Mm -hmm. Here are the averages of the effect that were, it was a growth hormone. It was about how our bodies create growth hormone with uh, the lack of stability and afferent firing. So like reflexes, mm -hmm. and your reflexes fire muscle, your growth hormone goes up. See how easy that was? What? I said, why didn't you just say that? Right, right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're, there's people who read the paper and be like, so what do, what do I do? Like, what does this mean? And it's like, right, right. Because that's, you really don't say that in a paper. Right. So, yeah. yeah a lot of the academics, that's why I just read the, uh, pretty much what's the, uh, what's it about? What's the conclusion? And they move on skipping over the entire critical appraisal because there's a lot of factors to factor into them. When it comes to the general public, though, do you think that that's a lot why many of the reasons why the general public does not change the paradigm of what works? I mean, the things that you're saying in your papers are well-researched and work. A lot of times people are not going to be following that because they can't figure it out. It hasn't really been broken down like you wrote your book. I'm I got sure two answers to your question. Mm -hmm. One is people don't really understand what a scientific study is intended to do. It's here's the test we ran, and here are the results of that test. Mm -hmm. Not you you need to eat this way or not, you know, like they don't, they're not very conclusive. And right. people want like a hard conclusion to these things because they don't really understand what a study means. Mm -hmm. What like you know, like every study says more research is needed on the subject. And anybody who doesn't like a study says, aha, look at that. They know they're wrong. Like, oh, my God, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Right. Because they all say that. But right. so that that's one problem. And the other thing is like, you know, like you read a good study 
and you say, why don't people know about this? And it's the same answer I had as before. Like, why isn't everybody using variable resistance or why are they still doing cardio? Money. Mm -hmm. You need to be able, like the reason people learn about stuff is because there's a marketing budget behind it. So why do more people think vegetables and more specifically carbohydrates are so good for you and you need them and your vitamins, oh, you need God, have your vitamins. That's bullshit, but I can get to that later. Um, Some of the best vitamins come in those organs. Delicious. Sure. Yep. Also, you don't need them, but sure. Right, uh, <laughs> right, right. So, uh, you know, when you look at, when you look at like, yeah, let's, let's go down that vitamin rabbit hole. Take a guess. How many, wh what amount of whole foods, if you could source your foods from all over the planet? Mm -hmm. Whole foods, no supplements. How many calories would you need to take in a day to get to your recommended daily allowance ascribed by the American Medical Association? They're saying what, 2,000 calories is the... Uh... They tell you to eat 2,000 calories, never more. But if you were just to eat whole foods... Mm-hmm. What would it take? How many calories would it take to get all your vitamins? It's a good question. Hmm. Well, I know the answer. I'm sure you do. I'm going to say, throw it out there. 500? What's the answer? 27,000. Oh, excuse me. I was on the other, wrong side of the uh, the equation there. 27,000. Right. So no one ever ate like that. No. A rhino does not eat like that. No. Like, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. Like, so the recommended daily intakes or allowances depending on who you're asking what should be said they're nonsensical they were they were just guessed back in the 1950s it, you know the, it's expert opinion mm -hmm. so they just pulled numbers out of the air it's almost like they wrote those recommendations to sell vitamins i was gonna say someone had to sell vitamins right and that's where i was going with carbohydrates mm -hmm. like the carbohydrate industry like Triscuits. Now, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I have read that there's a 600% margin on a box of Triscuits. Good for Triscuits. Good margin. Right. There's like a 4 or 5% margin on a steak. So who's got more money? Yeah. Right. That's why Nabisco pays for vegan research to be, to be done. Mm -hmm. Nabisco wants everybody to be a vegan because Nabisco knows vegans don't eat kale all day long. They eat cookies and chips and crackers and whatever every weak candy ass like shoving in their mouth. But now they have like a religious reason to do it. Mm -hmm. So now do you feel that some people based on their genetics may be predisposed to living better? If they eat a majority of beef versus greens, somewhere in between. I mean, there's the there's blood I type. I always hesitate to say everybody should be doing, you know, X. Because mm -hmm. there are differences between us. I, I don't know about necessarily just genetic. You know, some people can have allergies to certain things. You know, there's certain cheeses. Like, I primarily have animal-based nutrition. Mm -hmm. There are certain cheeses I will not eat because they have casein in them, and I'm allergic to casein. Easy way to figure that so, out. So that's... Now, do you do... Uh, is that IgG or IgA? Um, uh, IgG. Okay. So you yeah. do the testing as well and know what you should and should not be eating Yeah. based on that. Yeah. For the listeners that don't know, it's just a panel of allergy... Uh, potential allergy things, and it just tells you, like, I'm allergic to peaches. Which mm -hmm. is weird. Probably had five peaches in my life. <laughs> they're, they're so, massive. You know, I never really care for them. Uh, you know, <laughs> peaches, I'm allergic to celery, which is pretty much just fiber and water. So got me there. Uh, all melons, all nightshade plants, and casein. Strange combo of stuff, but yeah. So I think there's there's allergies and there's other little factors, but pretty much uh, there's there's no one impervious to oxalates. Hmm. So all plants have oxalates, and they're it's a low grade poison. 
Yes. It's an inflammatory, uh, and I think that contributes to a lot of the weakness that vegans have, as well as that they're not getting a, you know, any quality sources of protein, really. Correct. So, uh, do you yeah. feel that there's a difference between a grass-fed and grass-finished piece of beef versus grain-fed when it comes to general overall health, well-being, uh, making sure your labs still look great in six months to a year from now? Uh, there is definitely a difference. Um, I will always go for grass fed. Uh, mm -hmm. The grain finish tastes better. <laughs> uh, it does. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so, you know, it's fattier. It's nicer. And fat satiates you a lot more than protein does. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm a fan of the of the grass fed grain finished, but I'll go grass and grass mm -hmm. at, you know, I live in California. So we got a lot of nice, nice steak places that, that grass, grass finish also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they're, they're amazing. So yeah, I'll go for that. But you know, when I'm in the Midwest, it's grain and grain. So uh, yeah, I mean, if that's what's there, now, how do you feel about burgers from a fast food place, for instance? You still feel it's the same as uh, if you just eat the burger and only the burger? Great question. Uh, so I did a video once uh, with a friend of mine uh, who's an OsteoStrong operator. So I have no financial relationship with him because I licensed my technology to OsteoStrong, OsteoStrong, uh, has a business that they use the technology with. So there's no conflict of interest in this discussion that I'm having with my friend. His name is Orn. Uh, he lives in Iceland and he used to be the buyer of all McDonald's meats. He's a Michelin star chef. Okay. And so he used to buy all the meat from McDonald's after he did most of his chef work. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that a McDonald's piece of beef Mm -hmm. is likely to be higher quality than what you would get at a nice steakhouse. Really? So they're a McDonald's cow mm -hmm. is grass fed and grain finished. Really? And there are no fillers. There used to be. There used to be a couple of like soy based things they would keep in there to keep them fresher longer. But they took all that out. It's 100 percent beef. Uh, now I know Jack in the Box is the same. Uh there, there was like a, a list of most of Carl's Jr. is the same. And you have a uh, list of uh, Burger King by chance? I, Burger King was on that list, yeah. 100% beef. We may, may not know, we're putting together a movie called the Keto Project film. Okay. And uh, my colleague is our test subject. He'll do anything for science. And uh, we did a panel of 11 individuals, double blind of which – burger patty you like the best no condiments no buns um and we also had grass finished as well just curious what they thought of that he wasn't getting that at first he was getting that at the end mm -hmm. and we tested his uh i mean everything we tested his brain uh did brain mapping blood panels um digestion physical performance and what we found was after the th during the 30 days we couldn't get his ketones over one millimole per milliliter of blood on the Burger King. After the 30 days of the end grass fed and grass finished, he was regularly almost about three the entire time, which I'm just thinking you got me uh, in the Burger King burger. all beef there. And if it is all beef, then well, I got some more figuring to do. But it's uh, interesting that your friend's got the experience there. You got the light. Yeah, bulb. his experience was at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So that one I can. You know, he's not making this up. So I'm pretty sure that that's that's and thing. could just be my colleague. He's uh well, could just be him. Um let me ask you a few about proteins and aminos. Mm. Uh I love essential aminos. Absolutely just love them. Uh if somebody wanted to compare having protein versus having a serving aminos is there any translation of one to the other someone's wanting like 30 grams of not throughout whey or beef or whatever it may be versus x number of essential aminos that you get from your website um 
is there a translation and what should be had when and can it even be compared in terms of grams? You know, I'm really prepared for this answer, right? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so whey is like if you look at nitrogen as a byproduct of unused protein, like protein that wasn't digestible, which mm -hmm. is really just the wrong ratios of aminos. Mm -hmm. With you know the basically the parts of protein of no aminos are really amino acids, uh, parts of complete proteins that couldn't be used. So only so eighty two percent of whey becomes nitrogen and goes to waste. Mm -hmm. So whey, somebody if somebody gave me a can of whey protein, you know said hey I'm just giving this to you as a gift That's I would cool. probably say thank you I'd keep it in you know my pantry for a year and mm -hmm. then throw it away. Uh, you know, kids ever came over and they're like, Hey, let's have some of that great protein I gave you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but you know, that's not, it's not good. Uh, so whereas essential amino acids and yeah, you know, I, I get a lot of haters for this comment, but they have to be made correctly. They have to be made via fermentation. We're supposed to eat rotting stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, most now, I also can't speak about anybody else's product. Like I know that most people that take essential amino acids, even in high volume, they gain nothing because the essential amino acids might as well be sand that were made incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I make mine in a pharmaceutical grade lab with bacterial fermentation and I don't own that process. That process, the patent ran out on that years ago. Uh, and so mine was just called Fortigen. And I adjusted mine to be more muscle size centric. Um, I know a company called Perfect Aminos makes a great one that I think is more adjusted for um, like endurance, like endurance sports. Mm -hmm. But I was on my product, so I can't comment on it. You know, on, on on the other ones, and I know, like you know, bulk aminos or whatever. Like, I wouldn't even use that as in a cat litter box. Just <laughs> don't don't buy that. Especially, I mean, but it's like steak. It's like don't cut corners on a nutrient you're giving your body. Give your body the best. Right. Yeah. Okay. Like, don't Would you do differently to don't, make you don't, don't, don't buy your dinner from the from the, the hot dog lamps at the gas station that have been warming a hot dog for the last seven hours. Would you do that? No, you wouldn't, it's terrible. <laughs> if you're on the road and there's nothing for miles, maybe. <laughs> you know, well, didn't plan today well. You like bet. that's the conclusion you come to, but that's not what you would do. So why would you cut corners on your supplementation. In fact, the only reason you're taking your supplementation is to give your body the best because they all taste like crap. <laughs> Every supplement I, is yeah, pretty, yes, pretty lousy because you're trying to get some you know, chemical nutrients in your body. And there's a lot of these things that once refined, mm -hmm. you know, they taste like boiled toenails. They're awful. <laughs> so, but that's not the point. So right. who cares? But and then and then cutting corners is like, you know, like I, I remember there was a there's a fraternity brother I had. We had a, a lot of really wealthy kids in my fraternity, so they all had nice cars. Anyway, he dinged up his car, and he took it to like one of these, you know, spray and wait places, where they just do a quick paint job on your car. Okay. And you know, of course, like a month later, it was discolored from the sun and then like three months after that started flaking off the car and i'm like yeah that's what you get from like a 300 hundred dollar paint job mm. on a car you know it was like a fifty thousand dollar car he had a nice car just like you're an idiot yeah what are you doing so yeah same thing so what do you do in your amino blend to make it more muscle centric what, what amino acids do you increase as opposed to an, an endurance formula? Uh, hmm. I don't answer this question. 
that's a little my my secret sauce right there so oh okay uh, yeah yeah i mean because right now you know like the way to make these things correctly is publicly available information if somebody knows how to read the patents and read the clinical data that's been collected now this this for formulation actually started as a cancer treatment to prevent muscle wasting this is like early 90s i think 91 Okay. It would be like that. But, you know, so it's it's all out there now, but most people would look at it and they'd never be able to make heads or tails of it. So what we did was a little more optimizing and then we worked with the creator to, I don't mean God, uh, you know, the creator to um, get it right for the purposes of building maximum amount of muscle. So, even if I tried to explain it, I'd probably like hack that up a lot. Fair so, enough. Yeah. Was, a lot of people say that a lot of people you read the magazines out there and they say you can only have X number of protein per meal per sitting for you actually to be able to absorb anything. And there's a lot of research out there that pretty much says it doesn't matter how much you eat in one sitting as long as it's within a 24 hour period, which, uh, which way do you kind of go with that? With the research. There you go. Because the other stuff is just made up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, it's made up by people who sell whey protein. Like I tracked back to where that message came from. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I looked into like, uh, where, where, where was the earliest date I could find of like a, an image, cause you know, like that's been around since before the internet. Mm -hmm. so I wasn't gonna look for a timestamp on an article. I was gonna look for like an image from like a page scan from like Flex Magazine or one of those, one of those other like kind of, if you'd call it fitness, bodybuilding, you know, sort of things. And it's like, you can only digest 30 grams of protein. And here's the weeder 30 gram shake, you know, it's like, and you have to space it out. So people aren't going to like, I mean, now people do, but you know, back in the 1980s, you couldn't walk into an office with like four things of Tupperware for your tiny meals throughout the day. You'd be mm -hmm. fired. It's just like, you're here to work. You're here to dick around with your meals. Right. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. We ought to go back to that. Those, those were good days. <laughs> yeah, Ronald Reagan and everybody's making money. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, was the, it Weeder? It's what? Was it Weeder? The, the original? Weeder. He's, he's the guy. It's just like you can only get 30 grams. It's sort of like breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Right. Never no. said by any scientist ever. Yeah, Mr. Kellogg said that. Mm-hmm. And it was part of their advertising campaign because they developed breakfast cereal because before that breakfast was almost like a treat and it was like fried eggs and bacon. And it was like on Sunday, right? Before you went to church or after you came back from church, one of the two. So people didn't used to eat at the beginning of the day. They just had coffee and went to work. Mm -hmm. So they came up with breakfast cereal, and it's like, well, how do we get people to eat a meal in the morning? Tell them it's important, right? Yeah, tell them it's the most important meal of the day. And I still hear that. I go. still, to this day, hear people say, well, you know, breakfast. And I'm like, let me guess. It's the most important meal of the day? Well, yeah, you know that? Well, yeah, right, except it's not. And yeah, a lot of people still have trouble not eating breakfast or saying, I haven't eaten for five, six hours. What am I going to do? Right. Well, and these people have poor insulin sensitivity and they crave yes. garbage food all the time. Um, if somebody you know, is struggling with that, craving garbage food, they have insulin sensitivity. I mean, their body is a hormonal mess. Mm -hmm. you know, what are some little tips that you can give them to right here. regulate? I own none of this company. <laughs> a little xylitol uh, chewing it up. Xylitol gum. Yeah, spry. Get this. Uh, I mean, I have it right here. I don't really need it, but, you know, every once in a while, like, I had a birthday a little bit ago, and my mother doesn't listen at all. Despite, despite me fixing her osteoporosis, right, right? <laughs> you know, she still got, like, every birthday I have, there's, like, a giant cheesecake. And I'm like, mm. 
Awesome. Thanks, Mom. So, you know, I had the cheesecake, and then, like, the next morning, I'm just, like, you know, my stomach's just doing cartwheels. Like, man, I'm hungry. But I know why. Mm -hmm. And I think when you know why and you've been on the other side, you're like, all right, have some Zolotol gum. I'll be fine. Good little little trick there. Yeah. Going back real quick to the uh, aminos. Mm -hmm. If somebody is just going right into it, fasting, um, doing intermittent fasting, whether they realize it or not. I mean, before it became a thing, I did it and didn't even know I was doing it. A lot of people I find the same way. They didn't realize that they're going 12, 16 hours not eating and then eating in a oh, short time. There. I wrestled in high school. Yeah. We did multi-day dry fasts. Oh, dry fast. Yeah, you're oh, just yeah, no water. Oh, yeah, because you, you wanted to get rid of the water so you could drop down to weight class. Yeah. You drop like 10 pounds of water. And you hydrate before the match. And there were guys who would win just because their opponent would look at them and go, oh, I can't. Like, there's something wrong with the scale. How did this guy weigh in? That's how. Uh, so yeah. when, when it comes to aminos, is there too much that you can have? Uh, we can have them throughout the day. Is there a limit? Can you just drink it like it's uh, in every glass of water? No, I wouldn't do that. Uh, there's a limit to how much you can absorb. Mm-hmm. I'd say the equivalent of one gram per pound of body weight. So like Fortigen is 10 grams. But when you total your protein for the day, you count it as 50 grams. Okay. So um, yeah, if I do... Two doses of Fortigen, let's say one in the morning, one in the evening. And I will spread that out just because that's how they did it with the cancer treatment. Now, I think they may actually be, they may have like grabbed a hold of that nonsensical rule that you can only have, you know, a certain amount and have to spread your protein out throughout the day. Uh, I have asked that question to the scientists that developed the original treatment. They don't have a good answer for me. They don't know. Okay. They don't know why it was done like that. That's just what they did. Like I said, scientific studies are here's what we did. Here's what we found. Right. They're never like, here's how it all works. Because we we may not know why it works. We may be guessing the wrong direction. It may be a totally different physiological process. You know, like I hate the term keto diet. Because ketogenesis is not a diet. It's a physiological state of the body. Mm -hmm. So I can get into a ketogenic state by eating absolutely nothing. Is that a keto diet? You know, here, here's my keto diet. It's it's an empty cup. (laughs) It's right here. Can't you see it? You know I mean? Like, see, like when people come up and say, hey, I'm doing keto. And then you say, uh, you're holding a beer when they say that. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm at like a bar and somebody's like, oh, I'm totally ketogenic and they're like sipping a beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good job. Uh, yeah, so I hear that. And, you know, a lot of my friends want me to be encouraging and, and impressed with them, you know, and their nutrition. And uh, I'll be like, look, man, like beer's not on the menu. What are we doing? Right. Dump that out right now. Get a water. Well, let me ask you one more thing here. And uh, soreness versus muscle growth. A lot of people say, I got to be sore. If I'm not sore, if I'm not hurting, it's not working. If I'm not sweating, I'm not working out. You know, what do you tell people when they say that? It's false. Why soreness, uh, soreness also does not have to do with lactic acid. You cannot feel lactic acid. pH is very neutral. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt you. And it is. It does drive growth. Mm -hmm. It calls for many growth factors to be activated. However, soreness is from muscle damage. Muscle damage is inversely related to growth. So the more sore you are, the less you're going to grow. So like people, and this is why, uh, what do they call it? Like muscle confusion. I got to confuse the muscle. That's weird because when you get a suntan, you don't need to get sun from like a different solar system to confuse your skin. (laughs) You know, it's just like it's the same sunlight. (laughs) You know, you don't need to mix it up. 
You don't need to dump bleach all over yourself to make it even better or go through some other protocol. You don't need to hang upside down from a tree mm -hmm. to get a better suntan. Like, just go out in the light. It's one stimulus. It's always going to work the same way. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with exposing force to a muscle. Um, when you try and, like, mix it up, uh, you're really just creating more soreness. And in those periods where you're sore and you haven't really adapted to those movements or that activation pattern, mm -hmm. you're not going to grow at all. Mm. Because the protein synthesis that's happening is the repair of the old tissue. It's only when that is done and then you get another stimuli that you can induce a growth effect. So and there's research on this. I post it all the time. It's funny. I will post something and I'll have like two or three references, like as an Instagram. So I know you follow me on Instagram and as you know, like it's, it's hilarious. I'll, I'll make a comment and then I'll have three studies to support it. And then people will be like, well, you know, to hell with you. This is the stupidest thing. This is not how it works. And I'm like, well, which of the studies did you read and what part of each different study did you not agree with? Because I can tag the author. You write to somebody that was great. <laughs> yeah, you saw me, you see me write that all the time. Like I can get the authors involved in this conversation. The ones who have to perform the study, right? And because this isn't like a study I paid for. This is something that you know maybe was published in the '90s. You know, when I was in elementary school. Mm -hmm. So, like, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's like studies right there, but. You know, they don't they don't want to read it or they don't read it. They just want to have, I don't know, maybe it just makes them comfortable to think they have all the answers. You know what my favorite study in the whole world is? What's that? You'll remember this. You'll bring this up at cocktail parties. <laughs> the best study ever is Dunning Kruger, 1999. It's a psychology study, and it looks at competence. <laughs> And perceived competence. So basically, the dumber someone is, the more they believe they're completely competent. Like they're in, the, the, the dumbest people believe they're infallible in their decision making. And the smartest people underestimate their competence. So and they, they just just kind of barely underestimate. Like so let's say they're 100 percent proficient. Mm -hmm. or 99% proficient on average, and they put themselves at like 90%. But the people who are 10% proficient will put themselves at 100%. Mm -mm -mm. The irony. It's like the Chinese proverb, he who uh, truly wise man knows that he knows nothing at all. Seems like yeah. that he proved it. Well, it's also why Jordan Peterson points out that the bottom 12% of intelligence quotient are not allowed in the Canadian or American military because these are the people who will fire a cannon right through the deck of the boat and sink the ship. It was stupid. Yeah. And you know, who has time to comment on the internet all day? True. Yeah. True. <laughs> so these, these are internet commenters I, and they speak with such absolute authority. You really see it in politics. <laughs> You, know, you decide. You decide. You can. You can see the most absolutely ill-informed, uneducated, nonsensical crap spoken with such absolution. Mm -hmm. They know it all. This is the way it is. You know, they're trying to like explain economics or something, and you're like, dude, like, who ties your shoes for you? <laughs> <laughs> How have you not been killed? In, in just walking across the street because I feel like you'd be looking up instead of to the right and to the left. Like it's good you can laugh at that. You get enough of it, and I'm sure it's got to get to you from time yeah. to time. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being here. Uh, Absolutely. Amazing. And uh, this will be on every podcast device, most likely next week once I get the show notes done up. And uh, I'll send that to you and uh, we'll blast it on out and have some yeah, fun. Yeah, I'll promote it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Perfect. All right. I will uh, be in touch. Great. All right. Thank All you, right. Doc. Take yeah. care.